Rocket Lab's Electron is currently the second most launched privately built rocket in the world. But did you know that Electron is just the tip of the Rocket Lab iceberg? In this video, I'll be telling you everything you need to know about Rocket Lab, from their upcoming reusable launch vehicle and the systems that power Rocket Lab's vehicles, to quite possibly the most exciting space mission in the coming decade. This is one of my best videos so far, so yeah, let's dive right in. This beautiful rocket right here is called Electron, and it is the world's first partially reusable small satellite launch vehicle. Electron is Rocket Lab's first rocket, standing at 18 meters high and 1.2 meters wide, with two stages and an optional kick stage that bring its payload capacity to 300 kilograms to low Earth orbit and 200 kilograms to sun synchronous orbit. Its main structure is made out of lightweight carbon composites, housing liquid oxygen and RP-1 tanks, which power 10 main Rutherford engines. Awesomely enough, Electron launches from two separate continents because it has one launch pad at Wallops Island in Virginia, which is used mainly for US government launches, but they also have two beautiful launch pads on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, allowing up to 120 launches per year, from sun synchronous orbits down to just 30 degrees of inclination. Something really impressive that Rocket Lab is trying with Electron is recovering the first stage, which, other than SpaceX and Blue Origin, no company is really capable of. And unlike those two other companies which land propulsively, Rocket Lab's Electron is fitted with a parachute to allow for a soft splashdown. After splashdown, the booster is brought back to shore by a recovery vessel, after which refurbishment starts. There even temporarily were tests being done to, get this, catch the booster while in mid-air with a helicopter. Yeah. This plan was sadly abandoned after two semi-successful attempts at catching the booster. So far, a single Rutherford engine has been reflown, which performed perfectly, and they are working towards reusing other parts of Electron as well. Now about this engine, what exactly is so special about Rutherford? Well for one, its turbo pumps, main propellant valves, injectors and even the main combustion chamber are fully 3D printed, but that is not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is this. Rutherford is the first flight-worthy and flight-proven electric pump-fed orbital rocket engine. Now most pump-fed rocket engines usually use a traditional gas generator cycle, where a gas generator, which is essentially a smaller rocket engine, fires against the turbine, which in turn spins up a set of turbo pumps. These pumps then bring the propellants to incredibly high pressures and speeds for efficient combustion. But Rutherford doesn't use a gas generator at all. Instead, it uses two separate brushless DC electric motors to spin both the liquid oxygen and RP-1 pumps at around 40,000 RPM. This means that there is no propellant being wasted to drive the gas generator, because, once again, there is no gas generator. Now you might think, why doesn't everyone use this? Well, electric turbo pumps are actually only a quite recent development, because of course, you need a battery to power the electric motors. Most batteries with such huge capacity quite literally weigh a ton, and to put them on the rocket, you need to design them to be as small and lightweight as possible. Eventually, Rocket Lab was able to do this, and they built a lithium polymer battery that can provide more than 1 megawatt of power over 9 first stage engines. These batteries only start to weigh more as the rocket gets bigger, so it's really only applicable for small rockets, like Electron. So, it uses 9 of these electric pump-fed Rutherford engines in a sea level configuration on the first stage, providing a total of 225 kN of thrust and an individual specific impulse of 311 seconds. The second stage uses a vacuum-optimized Rutherford, which provides 26 kN of thrust and 343 seconds of ISP. The kick stage uses a pressure-fed engine named Curie, running on two unspecified propellants, and this kick stage is mainly used for efficient on-orbit maneuvering or deploying several payloads at different inclinations. But we'll talk more about some of Rocket Lab's orbital and suborbital spacecraft later. First, allow me to introduce to you one of the most beautiful and craziest rockets currently in production. Enter Neutron. This is Neutron, Rocket Lab's upcoming partially reusable medium lift launch vehicle. And unlike Electron, Neutron will be able to land propulsively, just like the big boys. And well, it fits right in, because this thing is 43 meters high and 7 meters wide, with a payload mass of 13,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit and 1,500 kilograms to Mars, or Venus. But we'll get to that later. Something incredible about Neutron is that, unlike traditional rockets, where the second stage visibly sits on top of the first stage during launch, Neutron's second stage literally hangs inside the main fuselage of the rocket. So the way this works is that the payload fairing is integrated into the structure of the first stage, and during stage separation, the so-called Hungry Hippo system opens up the fairing, which allows for the deployment of the second stage. 
Once the second stage is clear of the booster, the Farron closes again, after which the booster either lands on a drone ship or returns to the launch site and lands there. During descent, it controls itself using these canards, similar to New Glenn, and assuming all goes well, it would pretty much just look like you have the whole rocket coming down to land, even though the second stage is hundreds of kilometers away. This unorthodox system allows for first stage and fairing reuse, and also a lighter vacuum stage as it isn't required to withstand the atmospheric forces during launch. Neutron's first stage is powered by nine C-level optimized Archimedes engines running on liquid oxygen and liquid methane in an oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle. In this cycle, after coming through a set of turbo pumps, a full flow of liquid oxygen and a smaller amount of liquid methane mix and combust in a pre-burner, creating an oxygen-rich gas. This gas fires against the turbine, which starts to spin very fast, and because the turbine is connected via a shaft to the turbo pumps, those start to spin too. The main flow of liquid methane and the oxygen-rich gas from the pre-burner are then injected into the main combustion chamber, where they combust completely to produce thrust. All nine first stage engines produce a total of 6600 kN of thrust with an ISP of roughly 329 seconds and the second stage, which uses a single vacuum optimized Archimedes, produces 890 kN of thrust with an ISP of 365 seconds. In the future, Neutron is also intended to be crew rated, meaning that it can potentially fly humans on board, and it's also designed for mega constellation deployment, deep space missions, and to be as lightweight as possible, as just like Electron, it is made out of carbon composites. In 2024, the Archimedes engine performed several static fires, which all went very well, and in 2025 they not only completed qualification tests for the second stage, but they also started testing the Canards and the Hungry Hippo fairing for the first stage. As of the making of this video, the first launch of Neutron is scheduled for late 2025 from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia, and after that it already has several missions planned, one of which I will talk about in the next segment. Rocket Lab is planning several awesome interplanetary missions in the coming years, starting off with the Escape and Plasma Acceleration and Dynamics Explorers, or Escapade. Escapade is a NASA mission that will send two probes built by Rocket Lab, nicknamed Blue and Gold, into orbit around Mars. Here they will, among other things, measure plasma and magnetic fields around the Red Planet to gain insight into how solar winds contributed to the gradual loss of Mars' atmosphere. Blue and Gold are going to be launched on Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket, which, by the way, I have an entire separate video about, which you can watch after this one. And as of the recording of this video, Escapade is set to launch in late 2025, 11 months after which they will enter Mars orbit. Then in mid-2026, Neutron will launch the first ever private mission to the planet Venus in search of organic compounds in the atmosphere. In other words, this mission will research whether or not Venus might support life in its cloud layer. The appropriately named Venus Life Finder probe will separate from the Explorer Deep Space stage just 30 minutes before Venus atmospheric entry and will perform several measurements during its 5 minutes in the cloud layer. A few minutes later it will hard impact the surface as it will enter the atmosphere without a parachute. Then we have possibly the most exciting mission in the coming decade, which right now is still a concept, but with some perseverance, Rocket Lab's Mars Sample Return mission could become reality. Somewhere in the near future, Rocket Lab could be sending an MSR probe to Mars, where the entry and descent system will deliver the sample retrieval lander to the Martian surface. When it is safely on the ground, NASA's Perseverance rover will rendezvous with the lander and transfer its surface samples into the sample container of the Mars Ascent Vehicle. When the time is right, the Mars Ascent Vehicle will lift off from the surface of Mars, and in orbit it will dock with the Earth Return Orbiter, which would have been launched earlier on another rocket. Here it will transfer the sample container over into the ERO, after which it will return back to Earth. Five to seven years after the initial launch, it would re-enter Earth's atmosphere and bring us the first ever soil samples from the Red Planet, which would give us monumental insights into the Martian soil and potentially the life it might have harbored there. Please do keep in mind that this is still a concept, but if Rocket Lab's idea is selected by NASA, it could launch in the late 2020s and we might have Martian ground on Earth by the mid-2030s. Now I would like to tell you about the remaining Rocket Lab spacecraft, starting off with HASTE. HASTE stands for Hypersonic Accelerator Suborbital Test Electron, and as the name suggests, it is a modified electron that flies a suborbital trajectory at hypersonic speeds, so Mach 5 or above. HASTE is especially useful for, among other things, testing components for hypersonic vehicles like scramjets, as HASTE allows for highly customizable trajectories. 
It can carry payloads of up to 700 kilograms into a suborbital trajectory and payload deploy starts from 80 kilometers and above, but there is no confirmed maximum altitude that Hayes can reach. Then we move on to the four orbital spacecraft that Rocket Lab has, beginning with Photon. Now Photon is Rocket Lab's primary orbital spacecraft, essentially being a slightly modified electron kick stage. Photon is capable of doing super precise orbital maneuvers and can reach very specific orbits. And while it is mainly used in Earth orbit, the coming two years will have at least two interesting missions. Firstly, there is Victus Hayes, which will demonstrate rendezvous and proximity operations for the US Space Force, which is exactly what Photon is designed for. And secondly is LOCKSAT-1, which is a mission for ETA Space that will demonstrate the long-term storage of cryogenic propellants in orbit, as well as in-orbit fuel transfer tests. Then we have their second, and undoubtedly my favorite spacecraft, Explorer. Explorer is a high delta V interplanetary spacecraft and is compatible with other launch vehicles. Explorer flew for the first time in 2022 aboard an Electron for NASA's lunar mission Capstone, and here it sent a CubeSat into a rectilinear halo orbit, which is a very elliptical orbit over the moon's poles, as a kind of pathfinder for the upcoming lunar space station called Gateway. So this was also the first launch for the Artemis program, which I think is really cool. For the Escapade mission that I mentioned previously, the twin Martian spacecraft will be powered by explorers, which will have to perform Mars injection, several trajectory corrections, Martian capture and a bunch of in-orbit maneuvers, so they'll stay quite active during the entire mission. Explorer will also power the previously mentioned Venus Lifefinder mission, where it will do several maneuvers to achieve escape velocity, and just like Escapade it will perform several TCMs. For this mission, Explorer will not perform any capture burns, as the Venus Lifefinder will enter the atmosphere at full interplanetary velocity. Next up is a little more mysterious spacecraft called Pioneer, which so far has flown three times on Varda Space Industries re-entry missions. After being launched on SpaceX's Falcon 9, Pioneer was used to maneuver Varda's re-entry capsules into the proper orbit before deorbiting them. Since the third flight, Varda has moved on from Pioneer and started building their own spacecraft in-house, so Pioneer might not launch anytime soon. The penultimate spacecraft is called Lightning, and this thing is built for endurance. Lightning is capable of functioning in orbit for over 12 years straight, as it has high radiation tolerance and redundancy measures for several systems. Lightning can for example be used for telecommunication or Earth observation satellites, as these would need to stay in orbit for years. Lightning can be launched on Neutron and also other medium and heavy lift launch vehicles. Its first flight is expected sometime in 2025. Last but not least, we have this big flat satellite, brilliantly named Flatelite. I couldn't have come up with a better name myself. Flatelite is Rocket Lab's newest mass-manufactured space platform and can be used to form large satellite constellations like for example Telecom, Earth Observation and National Security. Flatelites are almost entirely built in-house to allow for as fast as possible manufacturing. Because they are so flat, Flatelites are stackable and fit perfectly inside Neutron's payload bay meaning that it can deploy multiple flatellites per launch. Flatellite is also compatible with other medium and heavy lift launch vehicles. And there we go! I hope you learned something new about Rocket Lab today, and if you did, please leave a like under this video, and maybe even subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. If you think I missed anything important, please tell me in the comments and I'll pin it so others can see as well. Thank you all for the massive support on my previous videos, I really appreciate it, and yeah, I hope to see you in the next one.